conference will now be recorded. Thank God. I'd like to call the Public Works and Protection meeting in order on Tuesday, June 6, 2023. Roll call, please. Gary Paul. Here. Kelly Service. Here. Join Euclid. Here. John Burnett. Here. And Jay Krieger is excused. Okay. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Action on the agenda. Have any changes or corrections? If not, I'll have a motion. Move to approve. Second. First and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, action on minutes from the Public Works meeting, uh, May 2, 2023 at 6 o'clock. Any corrections or Move to approve. Second. First and second. All in favor again? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. <clears throat> Comments from the public must be limited to items not on the agenda. It must state your name and address, limited to five minutes. Uh, board rules role is to listen and not discuss the item. Personal issues cannot be discussed nor individuals' names. Board is not able to take action on it at this meeting. Looks like everybody is here for a reason. Uh, I'll, excuse me. I want to go down to the right place. I'm here for a hearing for a for, he's here. For, he, he's, he's, on the he's on the You're on the agenda then. Okay. Uh, one more time. Uh, well, we got that takes care of that, and we got nobody up there on the uh, screen, so we're all right there. So we'll move on to item seven. Action items. <clears throat> Action item A. Action on appeal for denial operator's license. Cortina Taylor. Okay. Do we have any questions or anything on here? I just want if to state not, that. Would you like to open the floor and have her come up and? Oh, excuse me. I'm doing this backwards. We need the young lady in the blonde hair doing the talking first. Then we can move on. Chris, you're on. Thank you. Um, Quadrina is in the audience to speak. Um, the denial letter, the original application, and um, the letter from her is in the packet. So just wanted you to be aware she is here. Okay. I guess let's open the floor and let her come up and do her talking and we'll have questions and answers at that. Hello. State your name and address for the record, please. Pull the mic up so we can hear you. My name is Quadrina Taylor, um, 2108 um, Carstensen Lane, Apartment C, Green Bay, Wisconsin. <clears throat> okay, you want to explain your situation, why you were denied? Uh, Chief, you want to get into that first before we get into her? I uh, certainly can. Uh, she was denied uh, for failure to disclose. Um, she had some of the information on there. I had a 92 disorderly conduct. Uh, she had the possession of drug paraphernalia. Uh, I had a 94 delivery of controlled substance, which she has, it looks like, on there. And a, a 2011 DUI, so I'm not sure if that's the one she's referring to or not. And then a 2011 party to a crime retail theft as well. That wasn't listed on there that I saw. So she had 2009 re shoplifting. So again, I'm not really sure if the times are off or what, but um, you know, the, the obviously uh, the uh, controlled substance was an issue, uh, but she had it in there. So I just, it's really gonna be up to you on how you wanna decide that. Um, the dates are off on some of that stuff and she missed a few things. So I will let her explain that to you. Chief, what was the last uh, offense that she had? Was that 2011, did I 2011, get? correct. Okay, and that was for what? Uh, that was for OWI and party to a crime retail theft. Okay. 
Okay. Explain yourself. Um, well, first of all, I did not in any attention try to not disclose all of, you know, I had forgotten some of the things that I had been in trouble for in the past. Um, I'm going to be very honest. I was a bad drug addict, an alcoholic, did a lot of things that I'm not proud of. Um, but I'm 50 and I'm a different person now. I've cleaned up my act. Um, I'm a grandmother. My husband's here and my family loves me and they respect me now. Um, I have a job where I'm trusted with money and keys to the place. And I'm just, I'm just not that person. And I, I think everybody, you know, we all have changed and have become different people. And I just don't, I just don't want, I, I, I would like my, not my past to determine who I am today. I'm, I'm definitely not the same person. I no longer do drugs. I no longer drink. Um, and I feel like I'm a positive person at the place that I work. You know, I always have a smiling face, a kind word to say to people. So I feel that I am a productive member of my society. You know, I live close to my job and I do not have a license, so I'm able to walk back and forth to work. Um, so I, I just, I, I feel like I have um, something to give to my community. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to that? Um, no. Okay, so your last offense was 2011. That's two years ago with an OWI. Uh, and then you can see the progression here that the chief read off. Are these dates, well, we're not going to get into dates. You did what you did. Wait, 2011, right? So that's 13. That's, Pardon? yeah, 13 years ago. 12, 13 years ago. 12 years. Oh, that's 12, right. 12 we're years 21. Ago. 12 years ago. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. So, Chief, what is the, is it a 10 year? time span that we look at, but the, the denial here was based on failure to disclose. Yeah, correct. So yeah, so, you are correct in both accounts. It's 10 years not only for a felony, uh, but this was failure to disclose as well. So I wanted to make sure that she, that you guys made a decision on whether or not she obtained her license. So if she had disclosed everything, there would not have been an issue. Correct. Yeah. Can I say something? Um, on the sheet that you have to fill out to um, list everything, they give you a website to go on. And I went on that website, and not all of my charges were there. It wasn't until Chris gave me the website to go on where I had to pay money to see all of my charges, and I paid that money. And I'll tell you, I was so disgusted with myself when I actually read all of that so it was I, I wasn't trying you know i was really messed up back then i don't i didn't remember some of the things some of the crimes that i had committed it was not on purpose at all i knew you guys were going to find out so i would i really didn't try to not t list all of my crimes and there's there's been nothing for 12 years right? nothing so Nothing that I that I was able to see, so she's correct. I mean, I'm inclined to give her a second chance because she's been crime-free for over 10 years. Well, I have a question. In 2015, your family felt the need to intervene. What was going on that they had to intervene if you were clean? It was, it's, I don't know. Um, I had quit use well, I went on the methadone program and um, I got clean off of that. And honestly, I was still drinking and I guess they had finally got tired of all of that and, you know, just really had to let me know how it was making them feel. And as of that day, I never looked back. My family means everything to me everything and when you have your children looking at you and telling you how disgusted they are and how they don't respect you it it really makes you um want to change your life or it did for me anyway thank you 
How many children do you have? I have three. So when when did you actually get clean then? Because you said you're saying 2015 is what you're saying. Yes. 2015. Yes, I was clean off of drugs before that, but I was still drinking. Yeah. So she obviously wasn't charged with anything at that time. It was just her use that she needed to to uh, attend to. Yeah, it was my family life that needed a little fixing. <clears throat> Uh, and you were at uh, the uh, Shell station right now, is what I'm looking at? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll move to approve her license. I'll second it. Got a first and a second to give her a second chance. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Got three to. Three to one, uh, you have a second chance. You got a year, you better keep it clean because you- She's won't. got She's got to go to board first, remember? Pardon? She's got to go to village board, board first, remember? Oh, that's right, we go to the board, you're right. So you will appear in front of the board at- the On the 20, 27th, right? 27th it is, okay. Uh, so you've got an okay from us, we'll see you on the 27th. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, moving on to item B, action on appeal for denial operation for Jeffrey Wolf. Kelly, uh, Kelly, uh, Chris. So in the packet um, for Jeffrey Wolf, there is also the denial letter, the original application and um, the letter that um, Jeffrey Wolf submitted um, asking for you to appeal the denial and I'll turn it over to the chief. Okay. So uh, obviously he's got the 2015 DUI. I have that in 2016 in Louisiana and then he's got a 2020 violation of restraining order. That didn't necessarily show up on that but I'll, you know, I'll take his word for that. I also have a 1991 OWI as well as a 2009 OWI that I believe he's contesting in Pennsylvania. Um, that's our record. Um, I believe he's talked to our village attorney as well, um, and he's given him the same, same information that that's what we have, that's what the FBI goes off of. So whether or not that's an actual OWI or not, I, I think you know, it's, it's really, in my opinion, incumbent upon him to verify that that is or is not, or is not in his case. So. Uh, he's got three OWIs, uh, that was not disclosed, um, and so that's why, uh, for me, three OWIs is a habitual offender in my book. Um, it is, you know, I think legally as well, if you look at habitual offender status, so uh, that's the reason for my denial. Chief, what was the last one he had? 2016. 2016. So if I can just add a, <clears throat> a comment to a couple of things. I think Mr. I spoke with Mr. Wolf a few weeks ago um, we kind of went over the situation. Mr. Wolf did have a previous um, license through the village, uh, but when re reapplying, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Wolf, he was denied at that point, um, in part because of uh, the background check that was conducted, found the OWI in Pennsylvania. Mr. Wolf contests that this was actual legitimate um, OWI conviction in May of 2009. Um, we ran the background check, just as standard as every other applicant that comes through the village. Um, and uh, it's the, the same background check, the same database that all officers use in the state, in the country, agents, federal agents. Um, it's the same one. So it's presumed accurate. I know Mr. Um, Wolf can test that, it's, it, its accuracy. We did speak briefly about that and try to give him some pointers on what he could do to try to find his driver's license um, information or any kind of record in Pennsylvania. I haven't spoke with Mr. Wolf since then, but that's kind of where we left things. So in addition, I realized Mr. Wolf had a previous bartender's license or operator's license in the village, but it was denied it, um, this time as that OWI in Pennsylvania was not listed. Yeah, I think if, if, I, can, if I can look at it again correct, and correct it. Personally, I believe the one in Louisiana was the one that was missed last time um, because the Pennsylvania one shows up on his Wisconsin background check. The Pennsylvania one, I actually had to run his license through Louisiana 
in order to get that back. And I don't think that that happened last time. And that's the one that was actually missed. And that's why he was approved the previous years for that. So I hope that makes sense. When they're out of state like that, it's it's really hard sometimes to get an act to get the, the information to come back. And if I don't if I don't run a criminal history with the license specifically through that state, sometimes I don't get it back. So those communication between different states is often hard. So I really think that's the one that was probably missed last time. Otherwise, I would denied it last time as well. Okay. Anything else from the staff? Okay, uh, Jeffrey, do you want to add to this? Uh, only that uh, I'm very, you know, the 1991 offense I own, uh, I didn't put it on my original application because it is 32 years old. Didn't think it was necessary to put it on there. 2016 I own, that's not an issue, but I remember 20, 2009 very well. I left Florida in 2008 took a new job in Shreveport, Louisiana, was transferred to Houston in March of 2009, lived in Houston that entire year. My father died in November. The only traveling I ever did was to here to bury my father in Coleman. It wasn't me. I don't know how they're coming up with that. I, you know, I asked that you check. It's Jeffrey James Wolf, W-O-U-L-F, 513-63 Burr. I, I with certainty know that that 2009 offense is not mine. So I, you know, I, I don't know what else to say other than that, you know, I know the year, I know where I was, and although lived in Pennsylvania, uh, went to Penn State, graduated Penn State in 87, moved to Virginia in 88, went back for a couple class reunions well before 2009, and I hadn't been back to that state in 20 years. So I, I don't know who that is or why it's on my record, but it wasn't me. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. I did contact the Pennsylvania State Police. They told me I'd have to hire an attorney. This is a part-time job. I'm semi-retired. I'm not going to spend money for a job that paid me $5,000 last year. You know, it's just, this is a renewal. Gave you the same information that I had. So uh, I enjoy what I do. I'm pretty good at it. People like me. I'm right there at the Moose. You know. Living with my 87-year-old mother, that's all that I do. So uh, I'm not going to spend the money to prove it's not me, but with certainty tell you that that was not me. So didn't happen. Don't know what else to say. Well, I know you're working at the most. Uh, you got some conflicting dates there. We got to listen to our staff there. You got your story. Uh, I did do a little talking uh, about you. Everybody's happy with your work. Then a bartender. I don't know. What do you want to do? This one's a little harder for me because the offense is alcohol related or two of them for sure are maybe three depending if we count that one or not and one of them was as recent as 2016 um 16 yeah 20, yeah yeah that's the most recent one we're going by the 10 year rule well that's only for a felony so oh, i mean that's felony. yeah so yeah i mean you know, whether he, the information that we got was for the OWI in Pennsylvania was the same information that we got from uh, Wisconsin. So it's the same name, date of birth, all that stuff. So that's, that's not any different. So, you know, whether he got it in, a, you know, in my opinion, you know, there's three there. So the last one was 2016. So that's really upon you guys to decide if that's okay or not. Right. So um i'll let you guys debate that I, I just want to make sure that to let you guys know that the information that information that i got the wisconsin owi back was on the same information as far as the pennsylvania goes so whether or not they screwed something up on their end i don't know but it was the same information it's his information and if i add the day i filed for renewal for my application i filed 
I put my application in. I went to the Wisconsin DMV, obtained my Wisconsin driver's license. They only had record, and I checked twice, of the 2016 offense. They didn't have the, well, they had the 91 as well, but they had no record when I asked them of a 2009 offense. And I got my Wisconsin driver's license the day I put my application in for renewal. So I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. I mean, so they told we, me they didn't have record of it. If we would give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he's got two. He's got two OWIs and one was in 1990 something and one was in 2016. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do we feel about that? Excuse me. Keep in mind, he was approved, um, I think, two years ago with that record being um, given to the committee. March of last year. Thank you. March of last year with that. So what was different this time was the Louisiana conviction. Which I put on my application. And I need this job. Well, I'm going to make a motion that we uphold the denial of the operator's license for Jeffrey Wolf. You uphold it? All right, I've got a first. Anybody want to second it? Hmm. If not, we don't have a second on it. We have another motion. I'm wondering if there's a way we can get more information on that Pennsylvania one to confirm it somehow. Chief, is it possible to get a little more information? If I may add, I went on the internet and found a Jeffrey Wolf spelled W O L F on 5 5 2000 or 5 15 2009. I want to say it was in Lebanon or Reading, Pennsylvania. And then there's another Jeffrey Wolf that's only 31 years old that had some narcotic offenses in Reading or Lebanon, but neither one of them are me. I lived in Western PA for five years, left, came back, went to college, and right after I graduated, I got married, <clears throat> moved to Virginia, hadn't been there. So it wasn't me in 2009. Well, again, the information I have back from NCIC and the Wisconsin DOT clearly shows 515 of 09 and a guilty of implied consent, OWI, 93 of 09 for Jeffrey James Wolf, W-O-U-L-F, date of birth, 5-13-63. That is me. Wasn't me, though. That's two days after my 46th birthday, and I know I was in my apartment in Houston. Well, again, I think, I don't know that it's incumbent upon us to prove that it's not him. We can only go by what we have through the legal records, and that's what it shows. So again, that's up to you guys how you want to handle that. All we can go by or all I can go by is what NCIC returns to me with his correct information. Yeah, just I'll, I'll add a little context to it as well. So uh, obviously a license had been granted last year in March for Mr. Wolf with the knowledge that he had prior convictions dating back to 1991 and 2016. 2009. 2009. So the 2016 date is added. I think what you're really evaluating is to based on the facts that we have presented, and unfortunately Mr. Wolf has not been able to pre present facts contrary to what Chief, uh, Chief Ewell has indicated with that prior conviction in Pennsylvania, as, as to whether it warrants consideration as a habitual offender. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what you're evaluating. You have potentially up to three prior offenses to, uh, 91, 2009, 2016. Does, 20, does the 2016 conviction, if it is true and upheld, is that relevant and recent enough for you to deny the license? Or excuse me, the 09 one? 
Uh, and if those three offenses for those periods of time, 91, 2009, and 2016, are they, would you consider them habitual? Meaning in successive order, relatively short time periods, things of that nature. So that's, that's really what you're kind of evaluating. Uh, you can certainly look at it from benefit of the doubt. That's, that's your prerogative. Uh, but the facts are, as Chief has indicated, the report that he has, that conviction is on, on record. So last year, the, the committee approved it, even though there was a 2016 OWI. No, I don't know exactly which ones he had on there. Um, my, my guess is, is the one in 2016 was not on there through okay. Louisiana. It was so it would have been approved through the 91 and the 09, which would have been two, obviously a long time ago. The 2016, unless he put it on there, I, I don't know. Um, I, we'd have to go back. I don't, do you still have those records? It was on my original application. The that last year yeah. when you did it? Yes, yeah. so. the, that's the only one that I put on there. Okay, well, yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I can't verify that. Yeah, the 91 I thought was old. That it's wasn't going to be on my record anymore. Us. And 2009, one makes the guy. I don't remember. So you're saying that it was approved with only one last time? Is that what you're saying? Correct. And then I went to the DMV and saw that the 91 was on there, but I had already oh. filled out my application for renewal. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't speak to that. I don't know exactly what what was uh, what was on his application last time. Again, I know I've been a little more thorough with the out of state ones because I it's, I have a hard time getting those back just running in state information. So, well, if we deny it right now and he can gather more information, he can reapply, right? He can, he can certainly reapply, but he can also go to Village Board and, and argue for, there as Village well. Board, True. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to renew your motion? I can second. Okay, I'll renew, renew my motion to uh, deny the operator's license for Jeffrey Wolf. Second. To remove it. Hmm? To, to remove it. All right. That, yeah, I hear you. First and a second. We got a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Village Board, 26. 27. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 27, excuse me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Action item C. Operators denial license for Cameron Anderson. Cameron. Chris? Cameron. All right. Chris, you're on. So, as you know, Cameron's in the audience. Um, and his denial letter, his original application, and his appeal letter is in your packet. OK. Chief, your comments? So uh, Mr. Cameron has a very lengthy uh, criminal history. You can see his information that he put on his um, I also have a 94 disorderly conduct, a 94 battery, 95 battery, 98 theft, 2,000 issue of worthless checks, 2,000 disorderly conduct, 2,000 possession of THC, 03 domestic DC, 04 no contact violation, and 04 aggravated battery, great bodily harm, which is a felony, uh, 2,000 domestic DC, and 07 battery, and a 2010 child abuse, a reckless harm, which is a felony as well. So a uh, very lengthy criminal, criminal record. Okay. Is the last one from 2017? Or 20, 2007, sorry. The last, the last one I have is a 2010, and that's the felony child abuse, reckless harm. 2010, okay. Okay. Aaron, you want to explain yourself? Explain myself. I would like to say is, I grew up with our parents in the city of Chicago. I didn't know that else. Uh, <clears throat> 
Yes, I did some things. Uh, I grew up without parents, had no guidance. So the streets of Illinois was my guidance. And I, that was my way of life then. Until I moved to Wisconsin, seeing it was totally different. And I admit, yes, I was ever coming out power. You know, uh, I can't go back and change what I did. But I can say here today that my whole life has been changed since I accept Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I done raised six kids, still reside here in Wisconsin, from Marshall to Appleton. I got three boys at home with me. Uh, two graduated from Bayport. I got my third one just graduated yesterday. My 14-year-old graduated yesterday. Uh, I'm a single dad. You know, I had to get Seth out the way in order to raise my kids. And I, I'm very proud of what I'm doing. I wasn't always perfect, but my life changed for me when I accepted Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in 07. Uh, my child abuse, they took the kids away from me. They took my three boys away from me. Uh, I'm about the only one got them back within five months. They gave them back to me for five months. Yes, I disciplined them because uh, I wanted them to let them know that's a way you do things. They, uh, I'm blessed to have them. You know, I'm blessed and highly favored to have them and raise them. You know, yes, I did some things in my life. You know, uh, God forgave me for it. Uh, I'm here today. Uh, for a reinstatement of my alcohol license to just attain a job. I've been working from day one since I've been in Wisconsin, you know. Uh, and I need this license in order to hold a job. Uh, I'm about ready to retire now. Hopefully, pray to God, that this is my last year working I feel comfortable as shell. I do have a breathing problem real bad. Uh, I'm 61 years old, uh, and I need a license, a liquor license in order to stay employed at Shell gas station. Uh, I'm trying to get something easy now. Not a lot of hard work. Uh, on my application, I misunderstood it at first. But I have nothing to hide, you know. Uh, it, everybody can change, but you gotta want to change. And uh, and God changed my life. And whatever y'all take out of that is up to y'all. But I'm blessed and highly favored. So uh, with saying that, I appreciate y'all taking this time out to hear me and. Bless all y'all. God bless all you all. And I, that's it. And and if I may, there is a correction on, uh, he listed two OWI offenses. My records show those OWIs were uh, 20, or 1993 was an OWI, and also 2018 was the most recent OWI, not 2009 that he put on his record. So 2018 was the last one? Correct. 2018? Correct. Right here in Green Bay. I I don't look up to see where it is. It just shows when it is. It's uh, it was you were arrested on uh, November twenty third of twenty seventeen yeah. and yeah. convicted in eighteen. Is that right? Yes, sir. You, okay. You are so right. Yeah. It was Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving night. It was. Okay. Um, what shift do you work? Uh, third shift, sir. And that is? Uh, from 10 to 6, 10 a.m. to 6 in the morning. Or 8 to 6. Okay. Okay. Do you want to make a motion? Well, I'll make a
a motion that we uphold the denial of the operator's license for Cameron Anderson. Do we have a second? I'll second it. We have a first and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. You have the right to come on the 27th to the board and present your case at the board. That'll be uh, another shot that you can give it. With all due respect, it's all good. I, I shouldn't have to go through all this, you know. I, it ain't like I'm out there selling drugs, but y'all made y'all decision. Stick with it. God bless y'all and thank you. Action item D. Action on 23-24 retail alcohol license renewal. Uh, Chris. So these are the last three that will complete the, the renewals. Um, I do want to note that I received a phone call uh, yesterday from the owner of Edge VR Arcade and he no longer wants the wine license. He just wants the beer. So I would like to take that off, um, you know, off the agenda item um, and just approve the beer portion. But also, um, when you make a motion, please um, read the one that I have there because he does owe some money. Um, he's not the only one. So before you can grant it, but before I issue it, I make sure that all debts are paid to the village. Okay. In the uh, Lodge Kohler uh, and the residents in of Marriott, they got a full blown uh, like liquor license, right? The, what they have here is the one that just got approved last month for their little um, like little mini markets. Mini market, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion? I can move to approve the 2023-24 retail alcohol license renewals contingent on all paperwork and corresponding fees having been received and filed accordingly and all outstanding indebtedness to the village of Ashwabanon having been paid in full. I'll second that. And just add that um, Edge VR Arcade is only for the beer. And and the HBR Arcade is only for the beer. Thank you. And I'll second that one. Second that one. Okay, we got a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, <clears throat> item E. Consi consider, discuss, act on village of Schwab and ordinance number 6-1-23 amending special event. Patrick. So staff has met a few times regarding, um, we're kind of back with the special event stuff. Um, if you recall, I think it was last summer that we came back with some, um, quite a bit of changes to the special events in the managed market, uh, creating a policy, amending the ordinance, but creating the policy for special events and we discussed food trucks and everything. So we're kind of back to, to figure out what a more efficient way of um, in, enforcing and regulating uh, special events in the village. And we found some more inconsistencies with when applicants come forward and bring their special events <clears throat> application in their packet to the staff. We've been meeting, we've been discussing a lot with what if um, the event is actually qualifies as a special event. And there's some debate going back and forth whether they actually qualify for special event and whether it's needed, whether village staff or village services are needed to regulate it. And we found what a what a really efficient way is in kind of following other municipalities is simply do not regulate special events when they occur only on private property. So currently how the special events ordinance reads, any special event that occurs on the public right of way, village owned property, village parks, um, or any private property, so to speak, that's open to the public. So if you're having a, pro a special event on private property, but it's open to the public, you still need a special event license. That's where the majority of the special event applications come from. Well, I shouldn't say majority, but a lot of them do. And the debate, I guess, kind of what we're seeing is that whether they qualify 
or a special event or not? Are they defined as one? Do they even need a license? And we found that maybe the most consistent and efficient way is just to not regulate the special events on private property. However, at the same time, those events that occur on private property, open to the public, they would still need, we would advise them on getting their additional permits, tents, fireworks, alcohol licensing if need be. We would still regulate special events under this ordinance change when they occurs on village parks, village owned property, public right of way, events that really create and need village services, which is really what the intent behind this special event ordinance and policy is. It's when they take village services, that's when they need to be regulated and licensed by the village. Um, and that will continue to do so, uh, th but this just requires an, a change in the ordinance. Uh, that's one of the changes in the special event ordinance, and these kind of all, all run together, these next, th next few agenda items. Um, the other one was removing this kind of managed market language. Remove the managed market language, because formerly, if you recall, the managed market was, well, if you have more than, I think, two vendors on private property, let's just get one license and everyone's kind of under an umbrella license under that one managed market. We merged that managed market with a special event and it's just called special event. So we're also requesting removing that kind of, that language as well. And when we get to the direct seller's permit, we'll, we'll, I'll kind of explain that a little bit more. But basically, if we're removing the, that managed market, that the, the, these direct sellers and private property that could be considered special events, we have to remove that under this request because we're no longer, we would no longer be regulating special events and private property. That was a mouthful and I'm happy to answer questions. I know that was really confusing and other staff can chime in as well. Essentially what this ordinance does and what the resolution following it will, requesting not to regulate special events only on private property. They will still continue to get, continue to get the other permits. They just won't be, they won't have a special event license. Would it be a fair question to ask, or maybe I'm asking too soon, when is a permit needed then? <clears throat> I'll add a little bit to it. So a permit, a special event permit would only be needed in the event that the event is taking place in let's say a street or public right of way or on a village owned parcel, such as a park or at like the community center. An event that occurs, let's say on Title Town, that's a privately owned parcel owned by the Green Bay Packers. An example of that would be um, like their farmer's market, something to that effect. They have some music and things like that, wholly contained in the Tidal Town area, farmer's market, that would not require a special event. Uh, Epic Event Center had their uh, taco event and some vendors and things of that nature. Again, the event wholly contained on private property, no, no extension into public right-of-way or streets for the event itself, they would not need a special event permit. Um, an example where things kind of cross over a little bit would be the Summer Fun Days concert that was held just this past weekend. Most of the activities took place on Tidal Town property. However, there was an extension of the event into public right away along Ridge Road, and there were closures as a result of that. So that required a permit. Your permit. Right. The, um, <clears throat> the Distance runs, the, the marathons and everything that uh, continues to use village services and have road closures, those will continue to have special event licensing. They will continue to come forward to the village board. As Joel said, this is just removing private property events, if that makes sense. So we could say that anything to do with public safety for roads or uh, the street department anything to do with those two departments would need a special event permit because you're needing their services yeah um yeah i mean potentially based on the events to make it if... simple public service or the or department of uh public works are needed that's a special event and correct me if i'm if i'm wrong but if it's on private property open to the public the village doesn't have any liability. So there's it really, 
in my opinion, does it make sense to have it as a special event? We're not involved. They'll, like um, Patrick said, they'll still have to get a tent permit if it's necessary, or the picnic permit, you know, for the the beer or the wine, you know, that kind of thing. But otherwise, we don't have any liability because nobody's working for that event on village owned property. Okay. I think if you look at it this way, if it, it goes beyond the, the ordinary use of a street or public right of way or a park or other public village owned facility, it will likely require a special event permit. But if it's on private property, but yet open to the public, like a church picnic or something like that, that's wholly contained on church property, they would not need a special event permit. Unless, of course, they said, we, let's say, let's use Nativity Church as an example. They want to close a portion of Cormier Road to host their picnic on church property. That then would require a check, uh, special event permit because you're closing Cormier Road. Okay. Okay. Kind of simple. <clears throat> okay. There's no questions. I move to entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. Ordinance number 06-1-23, amending special events. I'll second. First and a second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Item F, consider, discuss, act on resolution number R6-1-23, amending the village of Ashwaban and special event policy. <clears throat> The, uh, this is kind of the, exactly the same as what we just discussed. Yep. The ordinance is pretty much the, uh, the enforcement behind it, how it's enforced on our code. This is the resolution concerning the policy. So the policy is changed by resolution. So what, we just, what the committee just voted on, exact same changes in the resolution with a, a couple additions. What we also notice is there's a lot of confusion with insurance really relating to class A and B special events. We're requesting just to revert back to the old way of $1 million insurance policy across the board. Not much of a change, but it's just, it's just a lot more consistent, easier, and more efficient. Okay. Okay. Do you want to make a motion on that one? I move to approve resolution R6-1-23. Second. First and second, all in favor, aye. 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 Motion, uh, motion carried. Keep it simple. Moving on to G. Consider discuss act on village of Schwaben on ordinance number 06-2-23 amending direct sellers permit exemptions. Patrick? <clears throat> so again, this kind of coincides with the special event um, amendments we just made. Uh, so if we're not going to be regulating special events on private property, we need to discuss what we do with direct sellers. So let's say a direct seller or a managed market or this special events where there's 40 different direct sellers on one private property. Um, we needed to change the ordinance under the direct seller event, or excuse me, under the direct seller ordinance to essentially no longer regulate that under a managed market, under a special event, uh, because again, it occurs on private property, the ordinance that was just voted on. So what this essentially does is it puts the burden and the onus back on the private property owner. The private property owner, like Title Town, like Joel mentioned, can have numerous direct sellers on an event. However, that event is just no longer licensed. What we crafted in the ordinance is we basically stated that you can have this direct seller special event slash managed market. So, uh, so be kind of weirdly defined, but up to seven consecutive calendar days. So you put a stop time and a start time on it, on a recognized business. So someone just can't go in a field and just start putting these direct sellers on there and have a, what's called a quote unquote, a, um, a temporary outdoor market event. So it has to be on a recognized business. And we did define what a recognized business is. Essentially, this is taking the exact same thing we just did with the special event on private property and change, doing the exact same thing with direct sellers. We're just putting it on the private property up to a certain amount of time. Everybody understand? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll move to approve ordinance number 06-2-23. A second. And a first and a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> 
Items H, consider discuss act on village of Rishwabana ordinance 06-3-23 relating to alcohol licensing procedure. Uh, Patrick, you on that one? Okay, it is me again. Um, sorry if I'm being a little long-winded here. Uh, just let me- You're doing fine. Share my screen. Okay, a brief presentation to show everybody on this one. Um, so what I wanna go over is that this ordinance that's presented again, if the committee recalls, I think a few months ago, there was an ordinance that was presented to the committee and to the board regarding how class B, which liquor, alcohol licensing, licensing is issued um, in the village. There was some feedback from the board regarding uh, tweaking the language a little bit and also doing somewhat of a presentation, a brief overview of how alcohol licensing is done um, in the village and how it would apply to this ordinance change. And um, I'll be kind of brief when I go through this. I know it, it might be a little redundant and repetitive for some of you, but um, I just kind of want to go over briefly how the alcohol licensing is, if, so bear with me. And by all means, for, for staff and anybody else want to chime in or have <clears> questions, I'm not, um, you can interrupt me and ask questions. So I'll have to wait for the presentation to be over. So basically a quick overview of the licensing. Um, primarily the village issues three licenses, class A, class B, and a class C license. The class A license really concerns retail sales of liquor and beer. So your class A, think of class A on premise, or excuse me, you're purchasing it at a retail store, a grocery store, a liquor store, um, or a gas station, you're consuming off-premise. You're buying and you're leaving with the alcohol. That is a class A license. The class B license <clears throat> is you're buying and you're consuming on the premise. Your beer, your liquor, you're buying it there and you're drinking it there. That's the class B. AOA, B bar. That's what the Wisconsin League of Municipalities kind of had in, our, in a presentation recently on that. The other one is uh, that typically we see through uh, the village is the class C wine license. Um, the wine license can be obtained separately. If you have a restaurant, it can be uh, uh, applied for and approved if you have a restaurant. Um, and, but if, as long as the restaurant food sales are greater than 50% of the actual overall sales. So A, B, and C, again, A, alcohol is for buying there and leaving with it, drinking it away, and B is buying there and drinking there. And the C is the wine license. Um, so the license that are issued in Wisconsin, <laughs> Licenses that are issued in the village, um, again, the class A uh, beer and liquor, the class B beer and liquor, um, and then the temporary class B, think of your picnic license, the temporary events. These are the, the picnic license, the beer and the wine. Um, why, you see right in the middle where it says class B liquor combination. That means it's a combination of liquor and beer. So under the state statutes, uh, someone cannot get a liquor license by themselves, a class B <clears throat> liquor license. So if you have a class B liquor license and you're buying at a bar, for example, you also must have the class B beer. So you have to have the beer and the liquor. That's why it's the combination license. <laughs> and these are the quotas that we have. Some are made through village um, ordinance and some are made through the state statutes. Um, the class A has 16, I think we're up to 13 right now. So again, uh, gas stations, uh, retail stores, um, 16 class A licenses. The A beer and the B beer, those are unlimited. Um, there's no statute requiring, the, you put a cap on that and the village doesn't have that either. Um, and then we do have 33 class B. So think of your typical bar license. We do have 33 of those and we um, do have 33 reserve licenses. The reserve liquor license is the same basically as your, your regular license. However, the regular license and the, it's basically based on your population. The village has only so many residents, so it gets 33 regular class B licenses. Same with the reserves. And then there's also the, uh, the state exceptions. So there's a state statute in there that basically says, well, if you want to promote economic stimulus to the village of your community, you can do so. As, and if you're capped out on your reserve licenses and your regular licenses, you can still do that. Um, if you have maybe an applicant that wants to have a restaurant. If you're a restaurant, you have more than 300 permanent seats. Or you have a hotel that has uh, a banquet hall or they have a restaurant as well. You have, an, you have a theater. You can get your class 
B, liquor license, your on-premise alcohol consumption, your drinking there, as long as you have one of those um, exemptions. And very briefly, I just want to note the last thing. This is somewhat different than state permits. So we are licensing these alcohol class A and B in the village. That is a little bit different than state permits. Permits regulating like wineries, breweries, uh, the railroad uh, downtown, that is a little bit more um, regulated by state statute. So I won't go into that in detail. I just want to kind of note there is a difference of that. So if you're thinking of the local breweries, they are regulated a little bit different by the state. Do the, um, do the allowed under exemption licenses count against our quota? They do not. So you can only get the exception license when you have reached your quota, though. And how often do how often is the number evaluated based on population? Is it every year? I think it's I think it, the census. If I'm, I believe. Because oh, I it, mean, we're way over the last cen census, aren't we? I get a population um, update every year, so then I recalculate with the hopes that we get another one, but we, oh. we're not at that point yet, but at, for every 500. Oh. Yeah. Every 500, you said? Yes. Yeah, if for some reason, the 2020 census had our population actually decreasing from the prior census by like six residents. But if you look at it, okay, so this is 2020. There was quite a substantial amount of effort in redevelopment, especially in the kind of this central sports and entertainment district. So we weren't necessarily realizing the fruits of our gains yet in 2020. But as these apartments and these units start to come online, we would expect to start to see some, some increase in population over mm -hmm. the next five years. Um, Short-term rentals certainly probably have an issue with that as well because of how people claim their primary residence. The other thing I, I just want to quickly add to this is so the regular and the reserve class B liquor licenses. <clears throat> the regular licenses, the number was established based on your population in a certain point in time, 1997. Um, so whatever your population was in 1997 when the statute was enacted, that designated the number of regular licenses you had. So then from that date forward, based on your population growth, you would gain or earn additional reserve licenses. So you can see our, based on the 33 and three number, our population has held fairly steady over the last 25, 30 years almost. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, the other thing I'll mention about the reserve that's different than the regular is, the reserve license statutorily requires a minimum of a $10,000 fee for the initial application, whereas the regular license does not. So you can increase that rate, but I believe our rate is just $10,000 right now, correct? Um, then the other thing I'll add to it as well is if you recall, the village had inquired, there's a provision within the state statutes that would allow us to purchase additional reserve licenses from an adjacent municipality. Um, it's kind of special to, a, to our area a little bit. Um, so we have the ability to purchase up to three additional reserve licenses right now through the village of Hobart. And I believe we've only used one of those, those three. So we, we have three based on our state mandated quota for reserve with the possibility of purchasing two additional reserve licenses from Hobart. Do we have those two licenses or we have the right to two licenses? We have an agreement that we can purchase when we, we needed. Yes. When we need it. Okay. okay. So I'll continue on brief, brief, briefly. The licensing procedure. So how someone gets a license basically in the village um, is that someone will come in and discuss with staff and they'll submit an application. The application will con contain what what do you want? What kind of alcohol license do you want? Do you want class A or class B, um, class A liquor, class B liquor or beer, et cetera. And they'll discuss with staff what kind of um, uh, business model you kind of run. And staff and, and mainly the clerk's office um, will discuss all the appropriate paperwork, uh, payment of fees, and primarily through public safety, they'll run the background checks. One that application is complete, staff then forwards that to the 
um, oh, to the committee and the village board, excuse me. And then obviously the, the licenses go to the village board if approved and then issued afterwards. Uh, so just keep in mind that our ordinance currently states right now that staff does not have any discretion when an application comes in. So as it stands right now, regardless of what the applicant wants to do, if they are, um, if they have everything approved, or excuse me, everything approved through public safety, through staff, their application is complete, and they have, well, a, a lawful uh, application, I should say, that they're running a legitimate business, then staff must forward to the committee and then onto the board for review. There's no discretion uh, in between what it is. It's, up, it's completely up to the committee and the board as of right now. Uh, but just reiterating what I just said. Um, so where we kind of, where this is kind of coming full circle is for this, this presented ordinance. So I know this is kind of difficult to read from this screen here. The, realizing right now I probably should have made that a little bit bigger. Uh, the, um, the village really has typically only granted these Class B beer liquor combination licenses. So this Class B liquor license that you're going to purchase the alcohol um, on site and you're going to consume the liquor on site. Um, really, the, the tradition has always been it must be more than something. It must be more than just a bar. What is your additional business? Do you have a restaurant? Do you have a hotel? Do you have a bowling alley? Do you have a grocery store? Um, or a theater, et, et cetera. Really, it, that has been traditional, the practice since I've, uh, well, since I've been told, let's put it that way. There are no typical just quote unquote bars. And that's where this um, ordinance comes, kind of comes into effect. And that discretion that the, that the village has is completely okay. That's perfectly legal to do. In fact, right in our ordinance, um, there is a provision where it says that the village can take these considerations into effect when adopting or when granting the licenses. Um, what is the economic impact that this alcohol license, this applicant is gonna give to the village? What is the uniqueness? What's the sustainability? Where, where is it located? The community impact. Do we want a bar on top of a bar on top of a bar? The village has total discretion to um, take that in consideration. Remember, the, app, the alcohol license is a privilege, it's not a right. That's why the, board, the village is allowed to take that in consideration. So this proposed ordinance basically takes that practice of granting the Class B liquor license into law. So what are you going to have in addition to your Class B liquor license? It now takes that practice, that tradition, and puts it into law. And basically what this says is kind of a reiteration of what was presented a few months ago. So no class B liquor license. So on premise, you order, you drink there to your typical bar. No class B liquor license will be granted for any premise without a primary, without the principal business being, and there's a list. Can I? One second. So the the Class B liquor license, how the ordinance reads, will not be granted unless it is one of the several um, businesses listed in the ordinance. So the state statute gives Wisconsin Statute 125.32 sub 3M, and it gives a list. And this list basically states is where the state statute, uh, where the state has recognized these businesses that could have something else, some other alcohol in addition to that. So basically what this would say is that we will not give you a class B liquor license unless you have one of these businesses as your primary business. So Chris, go ahead, sorry. So I, th I think you wanted it to say um, no combination class B license. You did, I kind of changed the PowerPoint a little bit right before I walked in, just for simplicity. The ordinance in front of you does have that combination license uh, language. But for, again, just reiteration and for simplicity, for clarification, the ordinance basically says that unless you have one of these things, you cannot have a class B liquor license. Do you have a restaurant? Okay, now we will entertain it. Do you have a hotel? We will entertain it. Do you have a grocery store? We will entertain it. Basically, the applicant will not, cannot come forward to you without one of these things attached to it. That is that, that's the tradition that the village kind of practices right now. It's just putting that into law. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So again, a question that the board had left. Go ahead. What Gary. we just seen there would be the new ordinances that you're proposing. The bolded language is, it's in front of you. It's a little tweaked, I'm sorry, but yes. It's not gonna have that exhaustive list on there, but uh, what is presented in front of the committee today is the proposed ordinance. It doesn't have this list. It okay. just kind of references the numbers. The proposed ordinance, okay. So the board had a question as to how this would actually apply, how it's going to come into effect. The, um, again, so currently every application that comes in, we send it to the committee, we send it to the board. That's the practice. We have no discretion in it whatsoever. How this would play out is that, oops, again, only those applicants that have that attached business will come forward. So the staff will not send an application forward if it doesn't have one of those businesses. Let's say someone comes in and says, I have a really, really cool idea. I have a slick, cool sports bar. There's an example later. I'm getting ahead of myself. But staff will say, you cannot, it's against the law in the village to have a Class B liquor license unless you have one of those things listed, restaurant, hotel, et cetera. So the cool idea is not going to work. The cool idea is not going to work unless it has unless it one of these things. The criteria yes, of exactly. What you said. A restaurant, let's say. So, and that is um, what we have to do is, as well. That's mandated. That would be mandated. So here's an example. Someone comes into Village Hall and says, I want a Class B liquor license. I want, I want to sell alcohol on site. I want to them to drink at site. I want them to have the beer and the spirits and the cocktails, et cetera. So they come and they have, and they said, okay, it's gonna be a restaurant. Village staff simply ha takes the application, assuming it's all correct, and we send it to the village, uh, we'll send it to the committee, and then the board, standard procedure is what we have right now. Someone comes to the board and they say, all right, I have this really cool idea, this really nice, it's got all the bells and whistles, sports bar, but it's only a bar. Yeah, hey, maybe we'll have a pizza or two or something like that, but it's only a sports bar. This ordinance, they wouldn't even be able to get to the committee. They wouldn't even be able to get to the village board because it would be against the ordinance, against code, for them to get their license. So we would not even take their application and send it to the board. The village staff would say, it doesn't meet one of those requirements, can't come before the committee. Um, The last example I'll present where the board and the committee still has discretion. The applicant comes forward to the village staff and they say, all right, I have this, uh, I want the class B liquor license. I wanna sell on site. I want them to consume alcohol on site, liquor, the beer. I'm gonna sell food, but it is a kind of a restaurant. Well, this is when staff is gonna be, inquire a little bit. What do you mean kind of a restaurant? What's your wait staff like? And we'll go forward, we'll get into the inquiries and we'll determine what it is or not. If it's close, the discretion still lies with the committee. The discretion still lies with the board. The staff is not gonna make that decision if they um, are a full service restaurant. We will, we will give feedback and provide advice, but that's not on staff to make that decision. That is on the committee and the board to make that decision. So if it's close, we will send it to the committee and the board under this ordinance. But again, unless it has, the application has one of those several things listed, then we will, it's prohibited to come even before you. So you will not see it at all. Whoops. Um, so again, this ordinance adopted is only for class B liquor license. It's only for those who want to buy the liquor and the beer on site and consume on site. This has nothing to do with people who are going into gas stations and leaving with it. This has nothing to do with um, going to liquor stores and leaving with it. This is only for class B liquor, not even class B beer. It's class B liquor and beer, if that makes sense. So again, if adopted, and, and kind of conclusion here, if adopted, we will send the applications to the committee and to the board provided it has one of those businesses listed. If it's not, they won't even get basically into the door. Now, there's a couple of things with this. One, it takes that tradition that the village has long had, puts it into law. 
can't even get in front of you because it's now law. The counter argument to it, it's contrary, is that, well, maybe the committee wants to have discretion. Maybe the committee wants to see every application. Maybe the board wants to see every application. It's okay to still take that traditional village value and apply it to every application. However, you won't see every application that comes through. You will only see those who have a, one of those businesses. And it's not necessarily a, a business that, yeah, I have a bowling alley, but it's only one lane and two people use it at a time. It's the primary business. That has to be your business. The alcohol is secondary. The business is primary. That's where this kind of comes into play. So I know that was a lot. Um, <laughs> and if staff or, or board have any questions, by, by all means, um, how many, happy to help out. How many licenses is this going to apply to businesses? I mean, I can think about that's going to be a hard thing to match for some businesses, isn't it? Well, as of right now, that's kind of what the village, how it's, how it operates. So we only have a select few of, of licenses left, which is true. There are some available. Um, but if an application comes forward and an application says, I have a bar, I want to be a bar. Can I, can I be a bar? If the ordinance is passed. We will have to tell them no, because under the ordinance, you, you legally cannot. Um, now, if you have this business that has a restaurant or maybe a hotel or whatever, um, then yeah, that it's possible that comes forward and you can still review it. You can still deny it based on the application. We're not taking any discretion away from the committee or the board regarding its approval or denial. It's all about that person getting in front of you. I um, I don't like it. I like it the way it is now, where we see all the applications and can decide. Because I'm I'm not sure. I mean, I know there was a fear in the past of us our village being overrun by taverns, but we, I mean, until it starts happening, you know, there might be a really great idea out there. Like I was just in a place recently where it was just a tavern, but you scan your phone with a QR code and you can order food from restaurants within a certain area and they bring the food into the into the tavern so let the tavern be a tavern and specialize on that and let the restaurants be the restaurants and specialize in that i think it's a wave of the future i mean if 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 we get even two taverns and you think it's too much we could adopt this then but i think until we're pushed with oh my gosh we're turning into a you know I don't know what you'd call it, a strip or something that we don't want to be. I don't want to do it yet. Plus, I think it's going to, like Joanne was saying, I think if you have this as an ordinance, then we're going to have to enforce it. And I think there are establishments already, sports bars in the area, that don't have more than 51% of their revenue as food. So who's going to who's gonna police it? Right. And... and... I should have touched on the restaurant a little bit more. That was a, a question that the village board had and what we revised. The initial ordinance proposal did have this 51% threshold of food sales in order to be kind of a restaurant under the definition. We got that from other state statute definitions. We kind of merged them a little bit. This one uh, removes that 51% threshold and basically kind of just puts in language that shows you were full service restaurant. Now, adopting this ordinance, you won't have discretion whether it is a restaurant or whether you're giving it to a restaurant or not. Either it is or it isn't. Um, the applicants won't even come before you if it's not. Right, I, I don't like it. I would rather have them come before us and we can decide, like the that poor house or whatever it was, where he's got the, you know, the high-end ovens and whatever he, I mean, we determined he was a full-service restaurant. Right? You, you did, and that you, will continue to be. You might have denied be, it, mm -hmm. and we would have approved it. I well, mean. yeah, I think uh, real quickly, I think Chris is going to help clarify something, too, on the on the restaurant aspect of it, too. So just recall that the, the present ordinance right now, the way the code reads currently, you have that discretion. You can evaluate each application on its own merits based on its own economic value that it creates. You just have to be careful that as you're using your discretion, you're not being discriminatory, right? So you can use discretion based on a set of facts, and if the facts remain that 
there's a higher or better use in determining whether or not this food establishment um, that also has a class B combination beer liquor license meets kind of your expectations for economic output, then give it, grant it, right? So you have that discretion right now. What, what this effectively does in any way, shape, or form, if you start adding these provisions, it limits or reduces your discretion to make those types of decisions. So you may have those circumstances where somebody comes in with a very unique idea that isn't quite um, up to par to the ordinance, and then, but just by default, administratively, it gets denied. That's why I don't, I don't yeah. like it. So Chris wants to add some clarification on the restaurant component to the licensing as well. So Patrick and I and Joel, I mean, we had talked about this, and then Patrick and I talked more. So I called the, the Department of Revenue to get clarification. So on that screen that I said it should say Class B combination, right now it says Class B liquor. It's totally different. Two different things. So the way that's worded, if we don't put combination in there, we could have like someone come in and want to do a wall of just craft beer and not have food. So I, I just want to make sure that you understand that. Yeah, I don't know if you want to bring up that screen. So I mean, does that make sense? Or do you want to see the screen? Yeah, so the ordinance in front of you does have that combination language that she's referring to. I, um, error on my fault, I, I just, I took that combination language out of the presentation. What's in front of you is what Chris is referencing, referencing and she is correct, yes. Um, one thing, the last thing I'll add is the staff's not advocating, it's, it's not making a, mo uh, a recommendation for the motion or, or not. It's just, this is what the board had requested that we revisit and we review. And this is what we thought was the most appropriate um, change to the ordinance, as well as the uh, presentation that, that the board referred back to staff. So, but to answer your question, Kelly, Joel is right, is that the board and the committee and the board uh, will not have as much discretion for applicants going forward if this is adopted. Uh, I know there's new things coming uh, we've been through that with our last application, and the village is known to have food and a class B. It's just a known thing. We never, you know, it just happened that way. Now we want to put something into an ordinance to have food and class B. I think we got in this one you're proposing, I think there's enough lateral movement in there in order to the board to make a decision the way it's written right now. If you see something coming up and it's questionable to you, you're going to bring it to the board like we did with the one we just approved. And we worked together on it to make it fair for both parties they have and they've shown us a new comp uh, a new way of doing food it is not a full-blown kitchen it's done in a different process but they do have a full menu it's just the way they're doing it it's the only thing different so i think what we got here is workable and the board still has the discretion to make that yes or no decision uh i'm I don't see anything wrong with it, but I do. And I know things are changing, but I think we we got we got to figure something out that's right for both parties. And I think you probably hit it right there. Yeah, I think Kelly mentioned something before about kind of an establishment that she recently went to. There, there's a place not in Ashwaubenon, but in another community in Brown County. It, it's a little different. It is a um, microbrewery that basically has a state issued permit to be a brewery. They do not provide or, or prepare food at their permitted brewery. However, immediately adjacent to it, there is a restaurant that services customers at the brewery. So that 
by having that provision as as being kind of drafted, if you will, in the code, you would limit those types of scenarios where you might have a very specialized food uh, preparer immediately adjacent to what could be kind of a unique um, uh, licensed establishment, if you will, and they work in partnership with each other, but they're two separate entities. Um, are, you do, are you talking Zambaldi's and Gallagher's? That's one. Uh, that's there's another one in Swamico as well, Anape, as well as the the 888 G's company up. I mean, up it's in it's a thing. Plus, mm -hmm. I up in Duluth. I keep talking about Duluth, but that's where we our daughter's in school right now, so we go there a lot. But they have a bar next to like the hippie taco place and the, you know, whatever burrito place and the whatever, you know what I mean? And it works great. You just have the QR code, you scan it, order what you want, and little worker dude comes walking in with a bag and says, Kelly? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Kelly, how close are these places together? I'm not familiar with what you're talking about. Are they within walking distance? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like having that in a squ town square, per se. Right. Where you can... Right. You know, I can understand that, but I don't think we're there yet here. No. You know, we got an entertainment district, but we got a long way to go mm -hmm. to get where you're wanting to go. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, I'm, I'm and just, just a reminder that the alcohol has to stay on premise. <laughs> the food can leave their premise to come to the alcohol lic the licensed alcohol establishment. Yeah, but I'm yeah. not talking about yeah. walking around, but I'm <laughs> saying the, the, the tight community that she's talking about in these two different entities we don't have yet, and we're a long way from that. Well, and District Poorhouse did bring that idea forward, but they went with an exemption. So an exemption, they had to have the 300 seats, they had to have the right. kitchen, they had, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're not that far away, though, because Green Bay and Howard both have them. Green Bay and Howard already have what I'm talking about. I mean. <clears throat> I, I just think we don't need this uh, new ordinance. We can just keep it business as usual. That's all I'm saying. So where the board, where first our committee and then the board has the discretion to approve the licenses or not. This proposal would limit how many licenses we even see because if it's just a tavern, it's, we're not going to even see it. Well, well, I'll I'll move to do I'll move to deny the <coughs> ordinance 06-3-23. I'll second it. Got a first and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. I'll be the only opposer to it then. And I'll just add quickly, this item will get, regardless, it'll board. get brought to the board. This was requested by Trustee Krieger and Trustee uh, Fluke, right. in particular the presentation. So uh, Patrick and Chris were working to satisfy that request from uh, those two trustees. Okay. Moving on. Item J. Uh, or I, I should say, uh, reconsideration of Grant Packerland roundabout intergovernmental agreement. Can we get your attention, Brian? I know you haven't said anything tonight. I hope you were staying with us. <clears throat> here, it's been entertaining. So I'm glad, <laughs> glad to be here. Um, anyways, uh, you guys may remember back in March, I had brought um, this intergovernmental agreement that was proposed from Brown County to us. Um, at that point in time, it was advised, actually, I shouldn't say I did, I think Steve Burr did. I was uh, out of town. Um, Steve Burr brought it to Public Works and Protection, um, and there was direction from Public Works and Protection Committee to go back to the county and see if there was an option or consideration from the county to include both Hobart and Lawrence. Uh, as this roundabout does fall in both, uh, or all three municipalities, um, with that, uh, in the interim over the past three months, we did also hear that uh, Hobart was willing to also financially support the project, um, and the county had then drafted uh, financial responsibility, um, which is shown in, in a diagram in your packet, uh, as to what municipality is responsible for what dollar amount. 
based on a percentage of what area falls in their municipality. Um, unfortunately, the way that the municipal boundaries are drawn, um, a good portion of the roundabout does fall within Ashwaubenon. That's why you can see um, our financial responsibility is far greater than uh, either Hobart or Lawrence. Um, with that, it is just a reminder, it is 20% uh, of the project cost is being split between the county, Ashwaubenon, Hobart and Lawrence. Um, the remaining 80% is uh, federal dollars through STP Urban, which is a grant. And we're using TIF funds, right, for our portion? Correct. That is correct. This project falls within the TID 4 boundaries. It was identified as part of the project plan. Uh, so it'll be one of the final projects before we close out TID 4. What kind of a split is it for, you know, is it an equal split in dollars? No. Um, so what am of the percentages, um, so of the project cost, 80% um, is supported by the federal dollars. 10% is by the county, 8.6% is by Ashwaubenon, 0.3% is by Lawrence, and 1.1% by Hobart. So it is uh, by no means an equal split between the three municipalities. Um, it's somewhat shown um, in, in the diagram uh, how, they, how they did come across those percentages. Oh, okay, all right, turn to page, Gary. Yep, page 48 of your packet. But it looks like that is representative of, I mean, everybody's paying for their share, right? Correct, correct. If you go by, by right away, yes, yeah. that, that is correct. Great. Who did the negotiating? Myself and Joel. Good job. <laughs> uh, Brian, has anybody done a traffic study on event traffic going down Packer land? Yeah, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, the Packers naturally, but, you know, a lot of people know some different ways of getting in and out of this community, and Packer Land's one of the ways to do it. Correct. You know, there isn't anything that I'm aware of. I don't know, Joel, if you're aware of anything, um, but you're definitely right. That is an alternative route. How uh, many times when there is a closure on 41, that traffic is pushed over towards Packerland? Right, right. You know, and that's the first roundabout we got in our area here as far as uh, within our village here. You know, and I'm just thinking of event traffic. You know, they work, I know that, but, you know, one of the reasons we don't have them here is because we got to get the traffic out of here. We don't, uh, a roundabout slow it up. We don't, we're not interested in slowing it up. We're getting it out of here. I don't know if that's a, something that's ever been brought up or not. Well, it was, I don't know if event traffic was per se, but as part of the STP urban grant application, there was review of that corridor uh, specifically related to its connection to the Southern Bridge. So there were conversations yeah, at the state level else. as well. Packerland being a four lane highway leading southbound from uh, to the roundabout is four lanes. So it will be constructed with a four lane departure southbound onto Packerland, which it currently, I think, is it go it splits from four down to two. Right. But it will be constructed as a multi lane roundabout to accommodate future traffic growth in that corridor. Yeah, that's right. That bridge is going to be out that way too. All right. All right. What do you need from us, uh, Brian? Uh, if we can get a motion and then this will uh, be put put in front of the village board later this month for their okay. consideration. I'll move to approve the intergovernmental agreement with Brown County Highway Department for the design construction of the grant Packerland roundabout and allocate funds from TIP 4 in the amount of $160,105. Second. First and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Last but not least, consider, discuss, Act, discuss slash acts and a request to for a, a, on a request for consultation consultant service on a review short term rental ordinance. Joel. Thank you. Uh, this particular item was brought forward uh, on a request from trustee service to possibly consider 
having a discussion more or less at the committee level about the possibility of maybe hiring a consultant to assist us in either crafting ordinance language related to short-term rentals or at least analyzing and studying the effects of ordinance changes on short-term rentals in particular as a result of changes recent changes to the ordinance um, this isn't something that staff has really taken a, a great detail of effort to look into at this point I'm not sure how or who a consultant would be to do such a thing uh, we'd have to do a little bit of research to figure out what kind of firms would be uh, able to assist us to kind of analyze some of those metrics and key datas uh, what i will say though is that what was presented to committee and to village board in relation to short-term rentals was essentially what we can do with our ordinance there isn't a whole lot of creativity that municipalities can entertain in relation to regulation of short-term rentals what you have is is essentially what is the strictest under the statutes if you don't take into consideration some of the grandfathering clauses that were made as part of the ordinance so we can either scale those elements back or we can uphold them and that and that's really the framework that we have to work from so the 180 days that is, and it being consecutive that is the strictest you can eliminate 180 days you can eliminate the consecutive clause that loosens the ordinance the six consecutive days uh, that is the furthest that is the longest amount of nights that you can require that is the strictest you can again scale that back to what we had previously um, so that would loosen it beyond that that's that's kind of it as it relates to what we're allowed to do within our statutes we cannot limit the number of licenses that we provide mm -hmm. we cannot limit the locations in which licenses can can reside in those those aspects are, are not possible within the statutes at at current so we could certainly look at it uh, the other aspect prior to this re request coming in was a direction from the board at the meeting as part of the ordinance adoption to conduct meetings and maybe focus groups with the short-term rental operators so staff is in the process of drafting letters of notice to send out to the existing licensees updating them on the change in the ordinance the updated application form that is going to be used for the upcoming licensing period as well as an invitation an rsvp invitation for licensees to participate in these focus groups at which point we can document and we can certainly ask questions as to how they foresee the impacts of the change in ordinance to their to their operation so with that i'll, I, I'll leave it up to the committee to to discuss and take feedback and go from there well i personally think uh, the board had went with the idea of the focus meetings with uh, both parties uh, i think that will generate enough answers enough questions and hopefully some good answers to either whatever the decisions are made will be made in favor of both parties so i do not see moving ahead with this at all till at least we get through what we've already documented on what we want to do i agree i think i think our timing overlapped i had my request in before we decided to do the focus groups so i think it makes more sense to have the focus groups, see what we come up with there, and maybe in the focus group say, you know, somebody suggested having a consultant, but here's the deal. We, <laughs> we can only do what we can do under the statute. What is a consultant even going to say? I was more thinking of it from a standpoint of we don't know what we don't know. So maybe there's something out there that, I don't know. I've had, you know, the guy who does the landscaping where I live is one of the people that was on TV at that meeting and he was talking to me for a half hour recently saying you're the one on the board who said that it's a unique situation Wrigley Field Wrigley Field has the same situation it's all residential on Wrigley Field and I'm thinking to myself is it which made me think maybe we don't know you know maybe we should have checked with Wrigley I don't know is Wrigley Field surrounded by residential it it's unique in that regard that again the challenges so the circumstances around the desire or demand for short-term rentals is probably similar but being in illinois what they allow or are able to do locally 
is likely different than what the state of Wisconsin allows municipalities to do mm -hmm. here in Wisconsin. So yes, there's comparisons to the business end of things, the demand and the need or desire to have these types of facilities. It's just a matter of how they regulate them in Illinois is probably completely different than what's allowable in Wisconsin. I just got the sense that the, the group doesn't trust how much work went into drafting that and how much work was done by the staff even though we said how much work we did and how much work they did, but maybe the focus groups will help that too, where we can present more hard facts and data that support what we did. I think the focus group is gonna show us a lot. Yeah. Number one, attendance. Yeah. Number one attendance, that's gonna say something. So. Are we uh, gonna have um, any representatives here like representative Stefan or so I think what we're gonna do our plan internally was to be likely put together about six dates of focus groups uh, at most and we were going to invite licensees to RSVP to one of the six dates let's say and it will be a first come first serve we will not have room or capacity to hold every single licensee that wants to speak that's not a focus group so the focus group may contain, let's say, five, seven individual licensees. There'll be some questions that are pre-formulated prior to, prior to the meeting, and we can do that. Um, if it's desired, staff can certainly reach out. We have a good communication and relationship with our local representatives, whether it's Stephens, Senator Coles. Um, we, we, can, we see them routinely. Uh, and we can certainly, you know, have those conversations directly with them. I'm just thinking because most of the responses we gave during those focus groups was this isn't a village problem, it's a state problem. You need to talk to your representative, maybe if they were there. Yeah, and I know Mary has had a lot of conversations with representatives over time, um, <sighs> just because of how limiting statutes are. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as I think Mary had described at the village board meeting, that the, the way the statutes read right now are the result of a last minute right. backstage affair in the budget in 2017. It wasn't a standalone piece of legislation. It was thrown in the budget bill in order to get votes to pass the budget. Um, and no one knew that it was in there until after it had passed. Uh -huh. So. It's challenging when you're very reactive to what the circumstances are being mm -hmm. forced and mandated upon you. Mm -hmm. uh, the focus group is only consists of the numbered registered short-term rental people we have. Correct. So we have how many, is 66 or seven the number now? We have probably closer to 70 at this point, right? Oh, 70 we're up, we're so they, they've kind of come out of the woodwork a little say bit we graduated mm -hmm. from a lower number to a much higher number in a short period of time so right all right uh, we need so some... we don't we don't need an, any motion or anything because no. it was just a discussion correct oh, okay all right information only all right uh, items for next agenda if you got anything bring it up to the uh, staff for your concerns July 4th thank you Terry, uh, is the next meeting, you will be informed on that uh, at a later date. Right now we've got uh, July, uh, what are we, following week, we might be looking at uh, the July 4th falls on a Tuesday and I think everybody is gonna be doing different things on that particular week. So we will be notified on that when the uh, dates are set. So other than that, if nothing else, we will obtain a motion to close this meeting and make it right, Kelly. <laughs> so moved. Such pressure. Oh, thank you. Too. Second. <laughs> motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you.